a very warm welcome everybody to um, our kickoff meeting as an information session uh, for the Sustainable Dairy Circle. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Wilson-Smith. I am the founder and the managing director of the Sustainable Innovation Company. The initiators of this project are from Grow More Biological, Global Boss, the Centre for Growing Sustainability, and the Sustainable Innovation Company as well. So, um, and why are we meeting here today? Well, importantly, the dairy industry has had uh, many, many challenges over the past 20 years. And our project is to mobilise a collaborative team of across the value chain from farmers, processors, innovators, system thinkers, creators, and importantly, not everybody has to be within the dairy industry. And we're purposely keeping this to be an open and inclusive uh, innovation circle so that we can attract um, people both within the dairy industry, but also outside so that we get some diversity. And what we're really trying to do is welcome fresh thinking and see what we can do for the Australian dairy industry, but we want to start with the Sunshine Coast because that's where most of us on the call are from today. So it's the starting point. Um, we will be covering some of the major challenges that face the industry. So um, one of the key ones is profitability. So over the past 20 years, there's been a declining number of profitable um, farmers, and then that has a flow and effect the whole way up through the supply chain. We also will be looking at the challenges for people and how to retain and train um, good staff and for, for the well-being of people. And it's clearly very difficult to be able to innovate or think sustainably about um, the planet when um, many um, within the dairy industry are struggling with financial constraints. So if we can work collaboratively, um, this initiative believes that we will have a better chance of being able to solve some of those biggest challenges um, by working in it as a collective team. And also, again, importantly, working with people across that value chain and introducing people outside of the dairy industry to bring new thoughts and fresh thinking in. So we'll be covering issues for farmers, for climate volatility, um, the increased competition from imports. We'll be looking at some of the challenges that processes have, um, particularly now with the impact of COVID-19. Supply and demand patterns have drastically changed and that's causing a whole raft of, of new challenges. And we'll be also covering challenges for marketers and ultimately the consumers of our dairy products and looking at how consumers of the future actually really are very concerned about sustainability. And um, they're looking at um, wanting to have a better understanding of provenance and a stronger connection of where their food comes from. So I do believe there will be lots of opportunities in that space um, when we look across this whole supply chain. So I'd love to introduce you to their um, fellow initiators for the Sustainable Dairy Circle. So in terms of the initiators, um, it's a pleasure to introduce you to John Moore. John is from Grow More Biological. He is a, um, a dairy farmer himself. He's going to give us a, a very inspiring case study uh, later in the presentation. And uh, with a raft of experience in really looking at how to transform farms from the soil up. And John is a consultant, and John, it's been an absolute pleasure um, forming this initiation with you, Terry and, um, and Danny. Our next initiator is um, Terry Stokes, and Terry is the founding director of the non for profit Centre for Growing Sustainability. And Terry, again, it's been an absolute pleasure on working for this and, and aligning um, values. Um, thank you very much. And then finally, um, there is Danny Hood, and we will also be hearing from Danny. Danny is the founder and the CEO of Global Boss International. He is a fifth generation farmer and a sustainable farming educator. And we'll, again, we'll be hearing um, Danny's daughter, 
um, Danny's story later in the presentation. Um, importantly on this point, um, this slide, I wanted to highlight that all four of us representing our companies are collaborative um, initiators who are doing this um, not because we are, we're not being paid by a government agency or, or any of the farmers or anyone. We are doing this as sponsors on behalf of our own business businesses and um, we feel that we are driven by making a positive impact in our local community and we believe that there are significant um, challenges in the dairy industry and we hope to make a difference. Um, this is a very open collaboration and it's an invitation to others to also come on board as, as sponsors and um, an invitation and that could be either, um, either in, in kind or, or by helping out um, financially, but we will be covering that later. But for the most part, this everything is um, has been driven by by impact. I'm just so a, a little bit about myself to introduce you to your, to all. Um, I'm the founder and M managing director of the sustainable innovation company and effectively what does that mean um, i'm an innovator and i facilitate sustainable um, transformations in terms of industries i've been working um, for the past 25 years in the agri-food industry in um, marketing and innovation and, and facilitation roles and focus on the strategic um, end of it and um, closer to home, um, most of that time I have, for the last 10 years, I've been in the herb and spice industry as the in-house um, global innovation um, director for um, McCormick and earlier for, for Gourmet Garden. And I'll be bringing a case study through there. Um, I'm an executive director on Food Agility, which is a CRC. Um, the co-founder of BAN and Sarah, Sarah um, Booker, who is, um, been extremely helpful and I know you're on the on the zoom call today Sarah is also one of um, the fellow co-founders there, there are a number of us there and I'm the immediate past chair in terms of um, sustainability I um, sit on the APCO circularity panel which is all about circular economies and I also sit on the Queensland manufacturing ministerial committee so I'm very interested in um, processing and it was an honour to be the 2017 um, recipient of the Rural Women's Award for Queensland. So it's with great pleasure that I'm here with you all today. Now firstly I'm not in the dairy industry and um, so my background with dairy and on a personal level I, I grew up next to a dairy farm so my best friend um, she her family had a 400 acre farm which I was often over there as a kid I'd ride my horse over and would help out with hosing hosing out the, the dairy so I sort of grew up with the smells of it but um, other than that over the past um, past few months and this is obviously pre-COVID, um, I've been able to get out to some of our local farms and a big thank you to Sarah Booker and also to, um, to Libby and, and to Peter Ruff as well. And so I've had the, had the pleasure of um, helping milk um, 65 cows actually, to be exact, of, of milk. And, um, and uh, so that was, actually I should say, as a child, we did have a family cow, which we milked by hand. But as I was the youngest, I, I wasn't particularly good at it. So it has been a great pleasure <clears throat> learning about the industry. So what our, this um, collaboration, the goals of what we would like to achieve, uh, there are a number of them. So um, we'll be homing in on a number of sort of key, key topics. And just to bring those to life, um, there's six there. So one of the first ones is to look at that transition from being um, potentially a very long and in many cases a broken supply chain um, to a value chain so that there is more value from the, from the farmer the whole way through to that the consumer feels that they are um, benefiting with more value as well. So that's what the transition from our broken supply chain to a value chain is, is all about. Um, it's also looking at improving natural capital. So when I talk about natural capital, it's really looking at our natural assets. So from our soil, our water and the biology 
and um, how can we optimise our natural capital so that it's we are more sustainable into the future? And the presentations that we'll be covering today do delve into that in a bit more detail. Um, creating a circular economy is another theme, and this will be particularly looking at how can we design out waste across the value chain and embrace more regenerative farming uses and to be able to look at the non-renewable materials such as plastic and, and packaging right at the end and how can we keep those in circular, circularity, circularity for longer. We'll be looking at adopting new digital tools, which clearly we are doing today. And, um, but that also includes things like traceability, um, which um, from the farm and looking at how can we um, share our provenance stories and have assurance of, of quality and making those connections through to consumers. And, and um, finally, it's sharing knowledge so that we can avoid um, duplication, sharing assets, and, and ultimately it's about connecting with consumers so that we have um, more engaged consumers who are loyal and are prepared to pay um, premium prices and feel that they get value for their, their dairy products. Um, so they're the big, the big note goals. Um, and how are we going to do this? Um, we have an approach and it's, it is a, um, a very simple approach. It's what you call design thinking, and I've distilled it to four really simple steps. Um, so the first part is observing what's going on. <clears throat> the second part is looking at defining the problems. So it sounds a little bit negative, but by focusing on the problems first, it means that when we come up with ideas, we know that they are ideas that actually solve real problems. And, and we look at the problems through the lens of each of the stakeholders across the supply chain. So, you know, firstly, you've got what are the problems of the farmer, then of the processor, then, you know, of the marketers and the exporters. And then ultimately, we really have to understand the problems of, of the consumer. Um, so how does this work in, pro in, in practice? You know, how practical is this? Well, I thought I'd quickly show a case study of outside of the dairy industry to show how this process works and, and, and a success story um, to back that up to as evidence. So this is an example of um, doing an observation for herbs and spices, since I've got a, a long history of working in the herb and spice industry. So we spend a lot of time with consumers in this case, understanding how they shop and what their pain points and what their problems are. Um, part of those observations included looking at what happens in, in hospitality as well. And, and so th this would be the same for the dairy industry. What are the experiences that the consumers have when they're shopping for milk or yogurt or, or cheese or, and, and, and the same in hospitality too? And what are the, their problems? So once we understand their problems, it becomes easier to ideate. So as with herbs, we looked across the entire supply chain and we will be doing the same thing for the dairy industry. So we'll be mapping out the dairy industry. As you can see here, I've done that for the herb industry. And we'll be looking at where are the problems. So for herbs, as an example, we had identified that the biggest problem was that fresh herbs die, they don't last very long. And so we found lots and lots of problems, but when we honed in on it, this was the biggest problem through the customer's eyes. And so that became the pivot of how we innovated. And then the process goes through uh, a testing and a co-designing um, solutions to the problem with your customers, which is why when we have these workshops, it's really important to do that in a collaborative way so that we're not just homing in on one part of the supply chain, that we're actually looking across the supply chain and seeing um, the problems of each person along that supply chain. So the ultimate story for um, the herbs is that uh, in 2014, the new lightly dried herbs were launched. And this was an absolute game changer for the industry and for a Sunshine Coast business, which then resulted in a couple of years later, the business was sold um, for over 150 million. So it was a, it was a, it was a great um, case study. And, and this product and brand is actually sold around the world as a in fresh produce. So it is possible. And, um, and hopefully that gives some insight and, and hope that we can do something exciting across the value chain. 
um, for the sustainable dairy circle. So I'm on to my last slide now, um, which really just shares uh, how we will be progressing. So today is the information session in April. And if you're still keen to be a collaborator, which we hope you are, uh, we will have a discovery workshop, uh, which will most likely be virtual. And in that, uh, we will be doing the identification of the biggest problems. So, um, so that we, we and, and it, part of that identification of the problems is that we do that across the supply chain. Then a month later, once we understand all those problems, we, we distill them and we can't re-rank out the, uh, the biggest problems. And then we have a creative workshop. And this is where um, we come up with new ideas on how to solve the problems. And then the fourth workshop, which would be in July, is where we look at of all the ideas, which ones are the, perhaps the top three and which ones are going to be the most impactful to create a more sustainable dairy industry for the Sunshine Coast. And impact would mean more profitable, better for people, better for well-being, better for our regional community, and finally, uh, better for planet as well. So we're looking across a number of criteria. And then from August really onwards, we'd be coming up with action plans. So that takes me to the end of my presentation. And what I'm going to be doing now is I will stop sharing and I would like to be introducing you um, to our second um, innovator and collaborator, who is um, John Moore. If you've got questions along the way, um, please put them into the, into the chat box. And, um, and then we can address those questions at the end because we're wanting to go through fairly quickly at this stage the, the information deck and then we do all the questions at the end. Andrew, I know you have to go, so um, thank you very much for joining us. Jackie, I do need to go, but I, I just wanted to let everyone on the Zoom call know that um, if they are um, exporters or if they are looking to export, um, uh, I announced uh, a couple of weeks ago um, what's called the International Freight Assistance uh, Mechanism. And what that basically does is the, the federal government's providing $110 million to primary produce exporters to help them get their products overseas to their international markets. Now, um, I, I won't be long, but I've, I'm just letting you know that... Um, because we're obviously not getting international flights into Australia at the moment, then one of our challenges is ensuring that our, our exporters get their product to overseas. So basically what we've done is uh, we've engaged a fellow by the name of Michael Byrne, who is a, uh, a very experienced uh, in logistics. And um, what he's basically doing is um, bringing... Um, all of the um, primary produce exporters together and looking at how we can get um, flights, special purpose flights um, to provide or get that product to overseas. And then that we then using those same flights to come back and bringing medical equipment back to Australia. So what I've done uh, is I've provided a fact sheet and I've sent that to Bry Lee um, so if I could ask Bri Lee to disseminate that fact sheet about the, um, about the international freight assistance mechanism, that would be great. We can um, so I'm, that. I'm sorry I've got to go, but um, uh, as you can imagine, things are pretty crazy at the moment. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we appreciate the support. That's great. Thanks, okay. Jeff. Fantastic. Well, a very warm welcome to, to John. And I shall um, hand it over to John. Thanks, John. Um, morning, everybody. And uh, I hope you can hear me and um, are sitting comfortably in your houses or your offices. My name is John Moore. Um, today, I'm representing a small initiative of a company or a business I've started called um, Grow More Biological. Um, she omitted to tell you that I'm a South African dairy farmer which um, I now live on the Sunshine Coast, having immigrated to Australia six years ago. I still run my business 
back in South Africa from, from a distance. So that has its own challenges. Um, would like to be known more as a mentor, not a consultant. Um, my ambition is to partner with dairy farmers and people in the dairy industry to make a better, um, a better business of dairy. As Jackie said, I've been involved in dairy for many, many years. Um, I'm a sixth generation dairy farmer um, from South Africa. So it's pretty much what my family is known for the last 120 years. And um, looking back at that, I ask you as an industry and as an individuals around the coast and wherever you might be, and in whatever niche you fulfill in the industry, what's your story going to be in 20 years time? Is it going to be a success? Or is it going to be an opportunity missed that we could have done something significantly different with and about? Um, I milk 850 cows in South Africa on a biologically focused pasture. It wasn't always like that. I inherited a business that <clears throat> was very broken, um, is on very poor soils, and it was a real struggle. And when I look over the hill here behind Mullaney and into the, um, the hinterland of the Mary Valley where I've started doing some work with farmers, I see quite a similar system. I see a, an industry that's in trouble. I see an industry that is asking many questions of itself. And it reminds me exactly of the position I found myself in probably 20 years ago. We were not profitable. Um, we were struggling with everything that farmers around this part of the world are talking to me about. And it really reminded me of, and rang bells, alarm bells particularly, of the plot and the position that the farming community finds itself in here. We were fa facing declining margins. In fact, we, are not pro we were not profitable at that stage. Everyone's talking about the increasing cost of production. <clears throat> the fluctuating milk price, um, deteriorating climatic conditions, you only have to think back to last spring and summer, which really didn't happen. Um, not many farmers I'm talking to are enjoying what they're doing. And it looked like a dead end for myself and for my family. And this had to end. I, I had no doubt in my mind that if we were to carry on with farming as a business and as a family business, this way of doing things had to come to, a, to an abrupt end and we had to change the way we were doing things. If this sounds familiar, and I speak particularly to the farmers who are listening in, as that's my, my sort of niche area, then I, I think I have something that's probably worth considering, the way we turn this hopeless and really um, dead end feeling into something that I could not be more excited to be involved with in our business at the moment. And I'm just going to share with you today what that looks like. I've explained to you what it looked like, and that was pretty awful. I want to show you and explain and share with you some ideas of where I believe we could help take this business um, on the coast. The first thing we had to do is, is get our heads out of the sand. And some people will say they hear your heads out of other places. But um, we really had to get our heads out of the sand and start working together. There was a group of us who are equally as desperate in a geographical area similar to what we have on the coast here. <clears throat> there probably were 20 or 30 farmers within 100 kilometers of our immediate area and that's not that different to the industry I see on the coast here. We were predominantly small scale and I mean from 60 cows up to at that stage anything close to 300 would have been a really big dairy back in the early 90s. Um, we were milking about 120 cows by hand I might add and um, that is in the, early, the late 80s early 90s. So the desperate farmers that I had around me were asking questions of each other. We were asking questions of ourselves. So a group of us came up with the concept of a study group. It's not a new concept, but certainly it wasn't one that was familiar at that point in time in the dairy industry 
in our region and sharing information certainly wasn't something that was easily accessible and people um, wanted to just throw their numbers and their ideas around. So we had to break some paradigms. Um, we had to change the way we did things. We had to trust each other. And we had many different skills. There's a group of people in front of you there on that slide who comprises the 15 or 16 farmers who are now part of that study group in South Africa. We farm collectively 25,000 cows over 10,000 hectares and produce a quarter of the regional milk in our area. And that is a complete and utter change to the industry that we started off with. So we employed a consultant, a fellow called Daryl. He was a friend of ours. He was, he was an ex-DPI consultant. We briefed him on what we wanted to achieve. And we got him on to our way of thinking that doing the old style farming wasn't working, even though it looked profitable. All 15 of us collectively could vouch the fact that we we're really struggling and we were not going anywhere. We found quite early in the piece that most of us had been focusing on things that were out of our control, the climate, the cost, the price of milk was the biggest one. And most farmers I talk to are very animated about the price of milk, but we soon realized we couldn't really control that price of milk. So we started focusing on what we could control. And to a large extent, that was the cost of production. And by far our cheapest food was the grass we are standing in there. We had to learn a different way of growing feed for our animals to stay, stay in the game. 15 years later, I'm happy to tell you that that group of farmers there collectively, myself included, we operate anywhere in the top three to 5% of profitable dairy farmers in the world. I um, would share my figures with you gladly to show you how we achieve that. Um, I tell you that not to shine a light on myself or our businesses, but rather to shine a light and to create a different way of looking at the same problem that we faced then. And I believe many farmers in this area are facing right now. So I'm gonna, if you will, I'll just take you on a short journey. I'm not gonna be long on one aspect of our business that was fundamental in changing the fortunes of us around from probably being not profitable as a collective group to operating, as I said, in the top five profitable most most profitable businesses in the world and certainly the most resilient businesses we can go through a drought now and come out the other side still profitable i might add that that currently is at 48 cents a converted liter to the australian price and we are still very profitable at that number if that gives some of you some context this is the journey over basically 10 years um, it started back in 2008 or 9. We had pastures that looked very similar to that. We were throwing on 550 kilograms of uh, nitrogen, which is about 1.2 tons of urea. We were growing 7.2 tons of dry matter per year. And we were at the top of our game, believe it or not, back then. That was the top of the industry norm back in 2009 for our area. We then embarked on a journey, as I said, pushing the boundaries and trying to grow more grass cheap, more cheaply and produce more milk and become more profitable. There's the same bunch of guys and, and ladies, um, farmers standing in my paddocks again in 2011. We had introduced species, um, different species into our pastures. There were clovers and ryes and uh, maybe a smattering of chicory. We had dropped our fertilizer from 320, uh, from 550 down to 320. And we had doubled, basically in those four years, we had doubled our production to 15 tons a hectare of dry matter. And we really thought we had made, made, you know, made it by then. We didn't know that we'd get much further than that. We were certainly, we had left the rest of the industry at seven tons where they were still producing in, in, the, in the old paradigm. We focused on the soils. We focused on the species 
and predominantly we're spraying our pastures at this stage and, and not putting a lot of chemical fertilizers down. As I said, this was just one aspect of becoming the, the businesses that we are now. There are many facets to a dairy farm, as many of you will understand, as many of you know. Pasture is our cheapest source of feed, and it was one of the biggest levers we could pull, and hence why we worked initially on growing more food more densely and more cheaply. Fast forward that on to 2018-19. Um, that's a photograph standing in the same position as that, that last group of people were that one there, same pasture, looking the same way. We are now under 150 kilograms of just the nitrogen. We're producing between 25 and last week, 27 tons of dry matter per hectare per year. There are 20 to 25 species of pasture plants in there, plus a smatching of weeds for good measure. I don't mind those at all. And they're all doing a different job. The metabolizable energy of that feed is three times what it was in the beginning. And we are significantly profitable growing feed that looks like that. If you'd asked me what the pastures would have looked like standing in that same paddock in 2008 or nine, I had no idea we'd be growing something that looked like a fruit salad. And um, it really has been a journey that I believe a lot of the farms I have been onto here can follow. Um, the production I see in the, in the Mary Valley here is very monocultured and there's not much diversity going on. I have learned a lot about growing pastures and particularly about the soil, as Jackie mentioned. This process is from a soil up um, approach. The organic matters of the farm I inherited from my dad, as I was telling you, were below 1% organic matters when I started. They were old cropping lands that had been hammered for many, many years. The pasture we're standing in here today is sitting at 7% organic matter. And some of our best pastures are over 11. We get a negative response to urea in a granular form on these pastures now. Um, one of my co-farmers actually says it, if he picks up the telephone just to order fertilizer, his pastures stop growing. So that's just the story of my pastures. Um, I'll quickly indicate you know, what that meant for us as an industry. I'm just gonna move something here. So for our business, that's pretty much what happened over those 10 or 15 years. Um, some of them were purely by mistake. I concede that we're working in an organic and a biological world where one input doesn't necessarily give you the same reaction twice, you know, twice in a row. Um, the big ones were we reduced irrigation. So from a cost point of view, these were all things that were in our control. And that was the significant difference between where we found ourselves in 2007 and eight, where we were focused on things completely out of our control to where we focus now on things that are pretty much in our control. And um, the one I wanna highlight is at the bottom and that's more lactations per cow. That was probably the biggest unintended consequence of this whole process is that we, got our cattle up from about four lactations to seven to nine. And that's double the, the profitability of, of our businesses. Um, it was unintended, we didn't, didn't set out to do that, but just as the nutrition of the animals got better, so their longevity, their fertility and their health improved. We haven't dipped an animal on that farm for ticks for I can't remember how long now, possibly five or seven years. And it's just testimony I think to changing the way we did things as a group. We pushed the boundaries. Um, in no way or shape or form could I have done this by myself. And that's really what my niche in this collaboration of um, the dairy circle really is gonna be. It's Jackie and the other players have, have their skill sets um, in different parts of the value chain. Mine is absolutely at ground level and um, my wish is to start a study group of, of some form or shape. Um, 
a study group can be two people. It can be one of you and myself. And we push boundaries. We change the way we do things. We look at the industry from, from the farm level up the value chain. And that's where the other players come in and help us to lever and to gear that to a better, to, into a better position. This project, as Jackie said, is purely funded by passion at the moment. Um, it's all pro bono. There's no one paying us to do this work. And I'm happy to continue that until such time that we either run out of money or we all get wiped out by COVID-19 or something. But I'm completely committed to this process. Um, my commitment to you is that I'll meet you where you are on the farm, where your greatest needs are. Um, I will share this information widely and openly with anyone that needs to see it. We have trials running here on the coast. So a lot of people say, well, this might work on your farm, but it won't work on mine. As farmers, we've all heard that. I have trials running on the coast right now. And I'm sure in a short while, we'll be able to demonstrate what we can do um, on the coast for, for the industry here. I'm excited. I'm not going to keep you any longer, but that's just a very snap short snapshot of my pasture journey. And I'd be absolutely ecstatic if we could do that and change the fortunes of some or most of the farmers here on the coast. Thanks very much, Jackie. Great, thank you so much, John, and um, such an inspiring um, story of hope from uh, that part of the supply chain. So next up, um, we will have Danny, and Danny will be sharing his screen in a moment. Danny is the founder and the CEO of Global Boss International. Um, Danny is a biological farming innovator and he's a fifth generation farmer and um, in particular is a sustainable farming educator. So um, over, to, over to you, Danny, as he's starting to share his screen. Okay, thank you everybody for joining in today and it's been a, a, a great pleasure. It's a learning curve for us all. Um, Jackie, can you just give it a thumbs up? I'm coming through okay? Yep, okay. So what I want to go through is just where, where we come from or where I come from and uh, how we got together along with um, John, as you can see by John um, and Jackie and Terry and myself, we've joined forces to create um, an avenue to be able to uh, help in the rural sector. And the way that I've been able to do it is through this company, Global Boss International. Now we're a Sunshine Coast uh, company uh, here on on the Sunshine Coast. Um, we're fully 100% um, Australian, and there's four guys involved with this company. And the reason we put this company together was to establish and develop biological, organic, sustainable solutions. And that's um, basically where we're heading and what we're doing. And where it all started is back here, and my sister's probably online, she'd probably be freaking now, but it shows us as a family. And um, we're all basically sustainable. And where this came from, I suppose, was watching uh, my father, the grey haired guy on the right hand side. Um, farming practices way back, you come out of the Mallee country in South Australia, if you would know that area there where it's sand, uh, limestone, rabbits, and a lot of superphosphate just to grow, I think, and it came up to central Queensland. And the whole family's been farming and grazing in that area now since he's moved, since he's moved to central Queensland, and he's never used a bag of fertiliser in his life. Understanding his farming practices, um, of course, as kids, we knew better with uh, the new farming methods, we went through them. And we put our own ideas into farming, but it's interesting, and I'm going to cut this fairly short because it's interesting to see that the farming mechanisms now are starting to do the full circle and come back. And it's really starting to look at what we can do for our soil. So as a teaching through, um, I suppose my early days as, as a, ch a young child, watching what my father did to be able to incorporate that through the company into what we can do and how we can play a part as being the fifth generation farmer. And why am I doing this? It's because of uh, where the future lies. And that lies in my son, a sixth generation farmer, 
and his son, my grandson, which is the seventh generation. So I think that we're all starting to adapt those practices to be able to look after what we have coming in in the um, future with uh, food production. And um, just looking at that, uh, with 10 years of, of product development, um, to be able to put a nutrient and biological rich liquid fertiliser and plant nutrient out there. So that's how we're able to do that. Just to give you a bit of an idea of my commitment, um, early back in the 2011 floods there, uh, we donated, the company donated 125,000 litres to flood affected farmers. So that was just to be able to help those farmers in that, that area and um, move forward. We're now working with some um, farmers throughout Australia. You'll see Waltana Farms there, Mike and Mavorka down at Hamilton in Victoria. Uh, we also have another lady, uh, Liz Jordan, that's joined us now down that area there, an organic uh, grower that we're working with. But it's impressive what these people have been able to do and we're working with them. Uh, Mike Nagorka is the largest flaxseed grower along with other grains um, in Australia. So it's quite impressive and it's very impressive what Mike's been able to do with organic um, and certainly soil biology is his uh, key feature there. Uh, chap below him is uh, Stuart Larson's uh, just west of Casino. 85% of organic soy um, in Bita soy comes from Stuart, so a very large um, organic soy grower. And they're also working with farmers in other areas, as you can see, by Lucent Growers as well as Broadacre. So it's just showing what we're doing. Uh, we're out and about and helping farmers in all sorts of areas. And why we do that is to be able to show what the difference is happening now through biology. And in this um, area there in the Central Highlands, uh, it was a pure example of some pretty tough years that they went through. And the difference with sorghum crops, what they're able to achieve with biology versus um, our standard way that we have farmed for many years. And John has spoken about that. So it's changing mindsets to be able to look at what your soil can deliver. So it really comes down to now talking about biology or no biology. So there's a mind shift there. There's um, a lot of people starting to ask questions and we're starting to see a lot of things change and starting to adapt the, the um, mindset of let's look at what we can do within the soil. So that's where our company is going. Just to give you a bit of an idea of our achievements, um, sort of environmental achievements, but also the bottom right hand corner. Uh, last year's um, agriculture or agribusiness innovations were featured in there. So it was a bit of feather in our cap for what we've been able to do. And to get on to the projects that we're working on now, um, the dairy one, which I'll mention in a minute, is uh, certainly an interesting one. But the reef projects we're also working on and being able to help farmers um, in a situation now where there's a lot of restraints coming in from government about what chemical fertiliser can be applied, uh, lessening that. So it's about being able to help them change and look at biology to lessen the nutrient runoff into the Great Barrier Reef. We're also discovering that there's quite a little bit of interest in the pasture dieback where people are looking after the health of their soil and it's showing through um, in that um, problem that's associated with the pasture dieback. As I mentioned, the dairy project, um, we have a lady that has joined us, Liz Jordan, an organic grower down there in Victoria. This was another grower down in Victoria and it purely showed through this um, person, they never uh, fed a protein in the bale. So she was able to get a direct uh, example of what happened when she sprayed a biological product on her paddock. So as you can see before, um, and when she moved the herd into the paddock that was sprayed, her milk protein went from 3.22 up to 3.89. When she moved it into the, the next paddock that hadn't been sprayed, went back down to 3.33, and it went back up to 3.89 um, in the paddock that had been sprayed. So it was able to give a direct example of biological and what happened in that process. Um, Liz, in, 
um, that joined us there. We were planning on having a field day on the 2nd of April, two weeks ago. Unfortunately, due to our virus situation, we were unable to hold that. And, um, but it was very interesting what Liz has been able to do looking biologically and she may be able to ask us some questions um, as we go through and been able to start to adapt John Moore's approach to pasture. So it's happening here in Australia and we're pretty excited about what we can do in the dairy projects here on the Sunshine Coast as well as other areas uh, throughout Australia. Other projects we're working with is the FBA, Fitzroy Basin Authority in Rockhampton, looking at um, soil health and certainly the, the runoff into the Great Barrier Reef. The chickpea crop there, the gentleman was uh, right into soil biology and got told that his crop was equivalent to an irrigated crop. Um, very interesting results for those chaps. And we have another gentleman, you'll see him in the green shirt there, here locally on the Sunshine Coast, he does rose grass production and been able to see what he's been able to achieve through um, John Moore uh, with the red cap and myself using biology within his production. Um, you'll see in that bottom photo where he left the last little corner unsprayed. He ended up with about a 20% increase in his seed production. He harvests that and actually does that um, uh, does a spray of biology over the top of that and then cuts that for hay and is well known uh, for the high nutrient value of his hay. Also we're working in um, Gardens by the Bay which uh, identify plant health certainly for the tourist in industry and also the safeness of being able to use a product like that. Cambodia and Vietnam is exactly the same as we have here. It all comes down to soil health. <coughs> We've had the other systems there that are not working, so all of these countries are starting to look at what can be done with soil health, and that's as we speak. Our vision is to provide sustainable solutions to the world's growing problems. That's what we're about, and the importance of biologically rich soil and high nutrient food. And I think that there's no time like the future with what we have with our pandemic at the moment is that let's look at what we can do with our food production here on the Sunshine Coast to get a better nutrient value for all to get a better immune system happening. So that's where I come from. I'm committed also to uh, our project. The four of us have got together and it's just a, an awesome team and we'd love to see the contributions for others out there. Thank you very much. The next presenter we have, and this is the last presenter, and then we'd love to open it up for some chat. So the next presenter is Terry Stokes. Terry is the founding director of a non-for-profit, which is part of our collaborative group here, which is the Center for Growing Sustainability. Um, this will be important, everybody, because as we go through a few months of workshops, and just to reiterate, this is the information session where we're a lot of talking at you, but after this, it will be workshops and, and breakout groups to identify um, a few projects is what we're hoping to do. And, and once we identify what those projects are, and they can be anywhere across the value chain. So clearly there's um, a lot of knowledge around soil, but they potentially could also be further up the value chain. And we certainly want to get a better understanding of from everybody across the value chain in, in dairy as to how it all fits together. Um, so once we identify those projects, that's where the Centre for Growing Sustainability is going to be really important because it's a non-for-profit. Um, so if we are applying for um, funding on behalf of the collective group, this will be um, a really important body for everybody um, to, to potentially benefit through and that's not to say that other non-for-profits couldn't get involved as well of, of course they they could it's a very open and inclusive collaboration so over to um terry i'll just ask you terry to unmute and we will have um the presentation from terry um which will just be um five, five minutes or so and then we'll open up to questions so start thinking about your questions and jot them down into um, jot them into your um, into the chat box, 
and we also will be able to take people off mute at the end too and, and in a facilitated way we can get people to have a chat as well. So Terry, I've just taken you off mute and, right. and um, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thanks Jackie for that and uh, thanks to uh, Danny and John as well. Um, you know, I, I get inspired by these people that I find myself surrounded by. You know, I love, uh, I love intelligence. You know, I love people that uh, are on top of their game and are, and are innovators. So look, I'm a co-founder of the uh, Centre for Growing Sustainability. As Jackie said, it's a uh, not-for-profit. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself outside of that. Uh, you know, I started my working career as, a, as an accountant, uh, specialising in cost accounting and then moving on to uh, feasibilities, uh, future mapping uh, of businesses. I was in the coal mining industry at the time. Um, you know, and it's almost like a past life for me, but you know, that sort of stuff and information I found just comes back and repeatedly plays a part no matter um, what area of life I'm, I'm working in. You know, on a, on a personal level, I, I became really interested in uh, natural health. In fact, I uh, became the president of the most successful branch of the Natural Health Society of Australia um, many years ago, over 30 years ago. Um, and one of the things I learned when studying natural health was gut health and the importance of gut health and its relationship to the rest of our um, being. Uh, being our physical health, uh, our energy levels, and also our, our mind state. Uh, I then went off uh, uh, for a number of years, ran a training and education uh, business, uh, particularly around uh, personal development, stress management, um, uh, and areas of that type. About 10 years ago, I uh, was introduced to, uh, to Danny and got involved in sustainable agriculture. And, one of the first things I saw was that what I'd learned about gut health was so translatable into soil health. That, you know, if the soil health, if the microbiology in the soil is healthy, as is it in the gut, well, then everything prospers, everything is more uh, abundant. So, you know, I sort of felt like I was a natural fit. You know, I, by nature, I'm a cause driven person. I always like to be, you know, doing something that's going to make a difference in the world. Seems to uh, light me up and get me uh, energized more than, um, you know, just doing rubber stamp type jobs. So, the centre was formed back in uh, 2013, as we said, as a uh, not for profit. Um, the vision was to. Um, create a secure future from the ground up uh, based on the premise of healthy soil, healthy people. And there's a lot of healthy things uh, in, in between that. And, you know, when you're talking about dairy, you know, Danny talked about nutritional value uh, of food. Well, the, the same applies to your herd. You know, the nutritional value of your grass translates through to the animal, um, a healthier animal, uh, more productivity from that animal, a better quality of milk, etc. Um, our mission was to provide leadership in eco-sustainability. Uh, so we wanted to be an exemplar as to how people could transition into more sustainable practices. And understanding that sustainability isn't just about the environment. You know, sustainability is about profitability, about being able to sustain whatever business it is that you're in. So, you know, it was a really quite a broad um, reach that we had. Uh, we are looking at all, inviting all types of businesses into uh, to participate in this. So some of the tasks of the centre was, you know, we were establishing a research and development centre for, uh, for growing sustainability, uh, conducting research on sustainable development of biological and renewable resources, uh, establishing a training and education centre was a very important part of uh, uh, what we we're about, and establishing uh, modern sustainable farming systems, again, was an important part of our focus. Here's a picture of some of the crew. We had a really wonderful bunch of, um, of volunteers. Uh, where at the time we started out, we're up at the uh, Big Pineapple and uh, we developed community gardens. We had education on a weekly basis. Sometimes twice a week, we'd have people come in and uh, talk about what they their specialty area was. And uh, you know, for the, a lot of the community members found that really good. Sustainable agriculture was our next move. Um, things changed up at the Big Pineapple and, you know, we kind of moved on from there and we never got to really do that sustainable agriculture. Interestingly enough, out of left field came uh, Dr. Ken Yang, who's a uh, 
Brisbane microbiologist. He's been in Australia for about uh, 20 years. And he, uh, he was interested in what we were doing in the, in the center and uh, what our plans were, because we had a really, good, uh, a really good plan in place as to where we wanted to grow and where we wanted to end up. As a result of that, we had a couple of delegations uh, come out to, to Australia, Chinese delegations, um, which uh, ended up uh, in the signing of a, uh, an agreement of cooperation between the Centre for Growing Sustainability and the government of Yunnan province. Um, you'll see, maybe you recognise someone in that picture, uh, um, Jenny Mackay. I don't know if Jenny's on the call, but Jenny's been a great supporter of us. Ted O'Brien uh, similarly supporting our process. What came out of that collaboration was uh, a plan, and that plan has now been um, brought to fruition, $125 million provided by the, uh, the government of that province uh, to build this, uh, what is the Wenshan Centre, the Sino-Australia Research Centre um, for Sustainable and Biological Pastures. And we were, the, uh, we were the Australian part of it, the Centre for Growing Sustainability. So that was some of our past projects, current projects we're working uh, to support uh, Mark Forbes out at uh, the Malula Valley, uh, who is building Australia's first residential um, placement for people with eating disorders. Um, you know, a lot of people have this in and around their family, Mark and uh, his wife um, had two children that were suffering from that. Um, so he decided to do something about it. And, uh, you know, the, on the left-hand side, you'll see the uh, building is actually being built as we speak. Uh, the aerial view there shows uh, this area here to the right. Uh, that's where the Centre for Growing Sustainability is going to uh, set up um, organic gardens uh, for the food uh, supply of the residents. And also hopefully that they can set up some sort of uh, market uh, garden uh, business that will allow them to bring some profitability. Uh, over here, this is a uh, currently a horse pavilion and that's been turned into a food production and relaxation uh, centre for, um, for the residents to be able to come and spend time with because, you know, there's, it's not just about the physical as, um, part of uh, this disorder, that's the whole mental, emotional side as well that needs to be dealt with. So we're really happy and proud to be uh, uh, supporting uh, Mark and we can't wait for the building to be finished so we can get in there and start to build the gardens. So it's just one step at a time. You know, this is a project, is this sustainable uh, dairy circle. We're so pleased to be involved in this. You know, it's an industry that's been crying out for help. It's, it's, uh, it's sad at times to look at the plight of farmers and uh, what they go through as humans, you know, what they go through in terms of the mental uh, stresses. And, uh, you know, it's quite, uh, quite debilitating for, for a lot of them. So we're happy to be involved. Now, Danny and I, uh, as Danny spoke about, you know, we've already been involved because I have an association with, um, with Global Boss. I, I work within that organisation. And it was actually Global Boss International that um, formulated the Centre for Growing Sustainability. So Danny and I had already been working in and around dairy, getting some great results um, uh, by getting people to look more at a biological approach to, uh, to their operation. Uh, and then we met uh, John Moore, and you know, you've heard from John, and John to me is just one of those great minds. I love being out in the paddock with him, listening to, to him talk to farmers and about pasture and picking up a blade of grass and telling a story about that that I'd never heard before. So, you know, we we're on the same trajectory, and it only seemed um, uh, there, was, there was no other choice than for us to join forces and, and work together. So we collaborate a lot together and, uh, you know, we're really, really um, honoured to have John uh, involved in what we do because of the knowledge base and the experience and the results that he's achieved. And then uh, came along uh, Jackie and, you know, I, was, uh, I knew Jackie through the Food and Agriculture Network. Um, as she said, she was the, uh, uh, one of the founders and uh, chairman of that group. And, uh, so, you know, approached Jackie about what we were doing, um, just to see, you know, whether Fan could help. And at that time, Jackie was uh, relinquishing her post um, and moving uh, more into uh, other areas. But, you know, I, I hope you've seen already what Jackie brings to the table in terms of being a great uh, collaborator, having some great design concepts to map us through what are the issues in the dairy industry, um, and how we can turn it around. I think, you know, 
I feel really fortunate to be a part of this group. I'm looking forward to whoever else is going to come on board. And I think we can really move and shake and make a difference for not only our Sunshine Coast um, dairy industry, but I think what we do here will be uh, transferable throughout the whole of uh, the country and uh, possibly globally. So, you know, what the, uh, the Centre for Growing Sustainability, I think the main areas of support we would hope to bring is funding is so important. You know, I know that farmers don't have cash laying around to, you know, throw into project programs. So we've got to try and draw funding to us through government, through other uh, funding sources. And, you know, grants are one of the areas that we can do that as a not-for-profit. I think you're, uh, in a lot of cases, you're better positioned to be able to uh, draw funding. Same with sponsorships. You know, our role in training and education is still, still really uh, strong at the centre of what we want to do. And creating collaborations. We've created some wonderful collaborations in the past with other not-for-profit groups, uh, with other for-profit groups. And we would hope to continue to do that uh, as we move forward. You know, thank you for uh, coming on board and uh, having a listen. I'm going to pass you back to Jackie right now. Thanks so much for that, Terry. I couldn't agree more that this is a, a very exciting um, project to be a part of. And I think having a, a non-for-profit as, as, as um, one of our, our first instigators and, and sponsors is going to be really important. Um, because as we do identify um, projects that we all want to work upon, I think we're all very clear that um, there isn't a lot of cash around you know from from the farmers themselves and even even as we go through that value chain so by working collectively together um, we would hope that to fund the projects we will be able to apply for grants as a collective group and um, or we can look at alternative ways of funding things from sponsors or from crowdfunding all sorts of things but I think the most important part is that we've got to work on this together and um, the dairy industry has already got for um, businesses, um, my own business included, that really want to get behind and support that. So we're coming up to the question time. So I'm just going to sum up and then open it, open it up. So I will go back to sharing, um, sharing my screen for the summary. And so get your questions ready as I do this sum up. So the, the real next call to action, everybody, is if you haven't already registered um, to be a part of the workshop, please do. This workshop will be in May. It will be towards the, the end of May. Um, so we've got some time and I'm suspecting it's going to be virtual. But what we will be doing in that workshop is we'll be breaking everyone up into smaller groups, into virtual groups. And we will be um, identifying what are the key problems across the supply chain. And I really want to stress that across the supply chain, because if you're a farmer, yes, we're going to be looking at your key problems. But if you're a farmer, you'll also spend a bit of time in a virtual room looking at the problems for processes and, and vice versa. And if you're a marketer or an exporter or an innovator, um, likewise, you will have time where the farmers and the processors will spend some time with you and, and vice versa. So there will be a number of virtual rooms. And in the process of this, we will be increasing our empathy and understanding across that supply chain. And, and we will start to get some ideas of how we can find solutions into the future from the soil right through to new business models and packaging and 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 different ways of 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 um of of um ideating going into the future as well so that's what the purpose of that workshop will be and that will be in may and then we'll go on to the other workshops later um throughout so if you haven't already um, you need to register your expression of interest to collaborate. There's no cost. I think we've been really clear that um, these four companies are, are sponsoring this. We will be hopefully finding projects that we can then collectively apply for, for either grants or some other ways of funding. So please, if you're interested, you should um, register here if you haven't already. And um, and then, yeah, I'm actually just going to end that here and open, I'll stop sharing and we will open it up for questions.